In this episode, I review City Lights from 1931. This was written and directed by Charlie Chaplin. He also starred in the film, produced the film, and composed the music for the film. His co-stars were Virginia Cheryl, Florence Lee, Harry Myers, and Al Ernest Garcia. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast exploring storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, theater, among other areas of the arts. For those of you who haven't seen City Lights, the plot, according to IMDb, is with the aid of a wealthy, erratic tippler, a dewy-eyed tramp who has fallen in love with a sightless flower girl, accumulates money to be able to help her medically. Wow, this is a phenomenal, phenomenal film. Charlie Chaplin's movies I have been meaning to see for years. I had I've seen a couple over the years. And earlier this year, I was invited on another podcast, uh, In the Seats with Dave Voigt, to discuss City Lights. So that I've only seen this for the first time earlier this year. Watching it again the other night was my my second viewing. I'll leave the link to my discussion with Dave in the description box below. Uh, I just, I, I loved it. And and seeing it again, I, I loved it even more. I, I almost want to say it's my favorite film now. <laughs> but I'll, 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 I'll wait. I'll, I'll wait till, uh, till, I have some, till I've seen it again and again and, and some years go on to see how much it stays with me. But I can't imagine a film like this not staying with me. It's it's so good. And it's it, it's the favorite film of, of so many great filmmakers. Orson Welles said this was a favorite of his. Stanley Kubrick. Uh, many, many. It also highly influenced Federico Fellini. Um, it's it's just it's just phenomenal. And the fact that he wrote it, directed it, directed the film, starred in it, composed the music. Uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, he truly was an artistic, artistic genius. It's a film that after I, I watch it, I say, well, how did he do this? How does he make a film so funny yet so moving, uh, so truthful, and and yet have so many twists and turns, yet be so simple and visually simple, all rolled into one? And I'm just thinking, how? Does he do this without any dialogue uh, on top of it all? And I am no expert on silent films. I've, I've actually not seen many silent films, which is something I'm uh, working on. And who's better than to start with Charlie Chaplin? But this film, uh, to me, is, is really a, essentially a love story, but it's, it also really has to do with being seen and, and being accepted uh, for who you are. And... The Tramp, of course, is this character who is a street character uh, and and is mainly thought of as a nuisance around people. You see right off the top of the film, they're unveiling this statue and there's these speeches happening. And that once they unveil it, there's the Tramp. You know, there he is uh, uh, sleeping uh, in the arms of this, of this statue and everyone's screaming at him to get off. Uh, and, and, and a lot of his the conflicts and the gags and the various uh, dilemmas and set pieces he, he gets into uh, are, are people often in conflict with him and, and treat him uh, like a bum. And, and so where, whereas this is all funny, it's also quite tragic because he he is made to feel that he is not loved for who he is, that he is not accepted for who he is. And it's, you know, also very well known that the tramp is someone who tries to uh, act and dress like a like a upper class gentleman. You know, he tips his hat off. He's got the cane. He tries to dress better the way his posture is uh, all of the genius invention by or by Charlie Chaplin. And I think a lot, I, you know, again, I, I'm quite new to Chaplin, but from what I've read about him and his life, the, the tramp, I, I imagine, is, is something he, he could truly identify with, someone who was brought up in poverty, someone whose father abandoned him as a, as a child and, and didn't want him. And so he, he was left to feel un, unwanted and very much like the tramp is feels un, unwanted. And so 
he's tragic, but he's a tragic clown, right? I mean, he's this clownish character who is very boyish and has a real uh, uh, sensitivity and innocence about him. You see also how the uh, the paper boys are laughing at him, and at the end of the film, they're uh, spitting. Uh, I forget, I'm not sure exactly what you call those. I think they're little pieces of paper through straws uh, at him. And so everyone, and and we are also uh, laughing. Not not so much at that part, but obviously a lot of the antics and the things he gets up to. Uh, we're complicit in in <laughs> in laughing at this guy, uh, but also can see him and are moved by him. And this element of seeing uh, being a big part of the film, I think was, was I, I, I don't know for sure uh, if this was a direct sort of uh, in, you know, picking on the, the talkies of the day and, and laughing at the talkies or making fun of the talkies because all, all these where he's encouraging you to, to see him and look at him and, and not to necessarily hear anything he has to say. And I'll, I'll get more into to why I feel that seeing is a big part of this film. But the the obvious, you know, joke on the talkies of the day. I mean, everybody at this point was making talkies in Hollywood and is the opening when the speeches are happening, when the unveiling of the statue and when they speak, it's just gibberish coming out of their <laughs> out of their mouths. And, you know, that was a, an obvious uh, tongue in cheek move by by Charlie Chaplin, but I think it goes deeper. Now I'll, I'll get into that. Um, but he he certainly gets to this, you know, early on in the film, where he goes and and he walks down these stairs, and there's a a, a rich man there who's very drunk and as an is you know tying a rock up to a rope and is gonna throw it into the water and drown himself and commit suicide, and so he stops this and and saves this man of course that's a great set piece as the rope gets around charlie and then he throws the rock into the water the billionaire and so then charlie goes into the water and they both go into the water and it's it's brilliant stuff and so the the drunk man uh be, wants to be his best friend and they both get drunk together and then you see uh the next day he doesn't recognize him you know again it's this because once he's sober he he doesn't see him and the blind girl can't see him uh and so once he sees her uh sitting on the stoop he what the little bit of money he had he was able to buy a flower and this is the thing that Tra Chaplin spent a, a lot of time trying to figure out was how does the blind girl, how is she made to think that the tramp is a rich man or or just at that point, just not him, not the tramp. And it's once the, the camera, uh, a man goes into a car and the door slams and then she says, oh, sir, you forgot your change. And then she realizes, um, oh, she thinks I'm this person who went into the car. And so now, uh, again, because he doesn't, and what's interesting is that he doesn't correct her because at this point, uh, well, I'm not even at this point. This is the, the, the what he's experienced for his whole life is that he's someone not accepted for, for who he is. And so he doesn't say anything. He just kind of quietly sits on the stoop, not making a sound. So she doesn't think anyone's there. And of course, very funny set piece where she goes to water the flowers. And then as she throws the water out, uh, it, it goes right up on his face. And so... You know, later on after this, she he gets money. He's getting money from the millionaire. And so he's once he sees her again, he's able to uh, buy all of her flowers and, and walk her home. And so she is this is where, you know, the audience knows for sure. And Charlie knows the tramp that she thinks that he's that he's a rich man. And of course, um, later on, what we see is that. Uh, he goes back and visits her and she's sick in bed and so she can't go out and work. And so so at this point, he's had a falling out with the millionaire. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, when he's sober, he can't recognize him and the butler throws him out. And so he gets a job to help her and she gets a letter that because she hasn't been working and that she's behind on rent and that she has to leave in, in, unless she can come up with uh, $22. And so the grandmother of the flower girl has hid this letter in a book. And as the tramp comes over to bring her things, he finds the letter. And so he knows he wants to, to help her and save her. And this, of course, is where this great 
boxing <laughs> match happens. Uh, you, you bear with me. I mean, this this is what the genius about Chaplin is that he has all these gags and twists and turns. Yet it is both so moving and so funny. Uh, and so emotional all rolled into one. And I think it's because his motivation was always to help her. And it, and and that is a it, that makes it much more human. Uh, it makes it much more emotional. And it just brings it to, to a, a higher stake, whereas she's going to get thrown out. And so he now gets into this position where he has to go and fight. And <laughs> but the fight, this is a great, a really great scene. The fight is a, a, a setup, and he says, you know, again, title card comes up, and he says, hey, you're gonna go easy on me, it's a, f they'll get 50 bucks just to fight, and so he was gonna take a dive, and they'd split it, 25 each, and so he'd be able to give that to the, the blind girl, and so what happens is this guy gets this telegram that he has to leave because the cops are after him, God knows why, and so now Charlie has to fight this other guy who's a, who's clearly a very capable fighter, and the the brilliance of Chaplin is that he he always knew when to go broader for for laughs, and then when to play it very very real for the moments where he wanted the audience to be really genuinely moved and or touched. And we clearly see this in, in this scene where at first you see one boxer has these uh, lucky, this, you know, various lu lucky charms and he's rubbing them on him his you know, rabbit foot to bring him luck before he goes and fights. And so the tramp's like, give me that. I need some luck. And he's rubbing it all over himself. That guy gets beaten up, loses the fight and they bring him back in. And he's, <laughs> he's totally unconscious and so the tramp then goes and starts to wipe off everything that he's rubbed on <laughs> on himself and and just the way in which he he then tries to befriend the uh the fighter that he has to fight now and he's you know he's he's kind of smiling at him he's like trying to befriend him and it's all in his behavior you you don't he doesn't have to say anything this is the genius of of Chaplin is that um, he, he, his, of course, with silent films, it's all in, in the expressions and behavior. So he knew how to convey so much meaning and behavior and emotion through, uh, his reactions. And, and this is his, this is just why he was so incredible. And so, uh, and his range was impeccable. And he says to the guy, title card comes up, hey, let's split it 50-50, go easy on me. And the guy goes, no. And then at that point, he punches another guy out, the fighter, not uh, the tramp. And then now he's really worried uh, that because this guy clearly is a capable fighter. And that that scene, in, the, in that boxing scene where they're jumping around with the referee in the middle and he almost wins at a certain point, but then he loses, you know? I mean, And your heart goes out to him because you want him to win. Uh, you're reacting to it like you would a real fight, even though it's so over the top and funny. And, you know, one thing that Chaplin was famous for was for doing, you know, a lot of takes. I mean, he sometimes did over 300 takes. Um, and this film was in production for three years. And which is incredible. And, and, you know, and, you know, when you hear that, you think, oh my God, 300 times. Uh, but I, I don't, I don't, you know, again, sure. Yes. He was a perfectionist, but when you watch these set pieces and the various set pieces in this film, like the spaghetti eating scene at the party with the millionaire, um, where, you know, the, uh, every time he, uh, sometimes one person moves and the, the chair is gone. So they hit the floor and then he misses the chair as he goes for his seat and he gets, uh, uh, this straw in his mouth that he thinks is pasta and then he's, he's drunk. And then <laughs> all these various gags, I mean, to block all of that perfectly, they're like choreographed dances. I mean, You'd have to do that a lot of times to get that right. Imagine how many times when they do a musical uh, or any kind of you know dance that's going to be shown to the public, how many times they rehearse it over a long period of time. Um, they must have had to have done that many, many times. I mean, did you have to do it 300 times? I don't know because I haven't done I haven't done anything like that, but. Man, I mean, it's it's incredible the details uh, and all the things that happen in in these uh, these various gags and set pieces. The same as that I mentioned earlier when he marries the sorry when he marries when he sees the millionaire and so he uh, about to kill himself and the going in and out of the water. 
my God, that must have been incredibly difficult because at the same time, you're jumping in water, getting out of water. I don't know how he did it. I do not know how he did it. How did he move his body the way he did, the way he would get up so seamlessly after falling over? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely... Absolutely incredible, and and so as the film you know progresses, he's he beef he again sees the millionaire. The millionaire went off to Europe, and now he's back, uh, and and so he tells the millionaire everything that's going on. He goes, "Don't worry, I'll take care of the girl." He's like, "Is a thousand dollars enough?" He's like, "He only needed twenty two dollars," and he's at the same time this the suspense sequence is that there's uh, two robbers in the house, and so they're hiding, and. He gives the tramp all this money, and then when the robbers come out, the guns guns get fired. They knock out the millionaire. Uh, they hit him over the head, and they run away. And the butler comes in at that moment, and now here's the millionaire knocked out, and the tramp holding a thousand dollars. And so he thinks that he did it, uh, that he is the robber. And so the cops come. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny, but at the same time, you're like, you want the tramp to get that money to bring to the girl so they can be together and so that he can help her and save her. And and it's just amazing how the, the it's not just funny, but also incredibly um, emotional because you're rooting for the tramp and you want him to help the flower girl. And so he's able to get away and he goes, this is a great, beautiful moving scene as he gets to the flower girl and he gives her all the money and, you know, and, and he knows he's going to, he's going to go have to go to jail, which, um, which he does. And so again, keep in mind at this point, he still hasn't told her anything about who he really is. She still thinks that he's very, very rich. Um, and he doesn't know what to do at this point. <laughs> he goes to jail, right? And he comes out of jail and now he looks like hell. I mean, he's in rags. His clothes are all torn up. And again, um, this is a scene where he played, you know, very truthfully. And it's the greatest, one of the great scenes in this film, possibly one of the great scenes in film history uh, as the, you know, the paper boy boys are picking on him and making fun of him. And he walks through a store window and there's now the flower girl is not just selling flowers on the street. She obviously took that thousand dollars. She's able to start this business and her, uh, how could I have forgotten the, the element of her blindness is now she can see. And it was the tramp who told her about this doctor who came up with a cure for blindness. And she was able to use the money to pay for the operation as well. So th he's, he's saved her life. You know, I mean, he, he, she now can see because of him. She now has a successful business become of it because of him. And Virginia Cheryl, I mean, her performance is so subtle. And I mean, she's extremely convincing as a blind person and so moving and vulnerable. And you know, just from her behavior that she's waiting for hoping as she she waits as she sits in the store that he he's going to turn up sometime. She doesn't know anything that happened to him about going to jail. She doesn't even know him. Uh, she just thinks he's a rich man. And so every time someone rich comes in, you see the look of hope on her face that it's going to be him and it's not him. It's some other guy. Uh, and then sure enough, as he passes the window, he, she is even laughing at him and, and you know, the way he's, the way he, the way he looks and the, the fact that the paper boys are making fun of him. And of course this beautiful moment, uh, of, of looking at him and the way in which he looks at her with such familiarity, she knows exactly who he is. And you see her, the tears fill up in her eyes and the tears fill, fill up in his eyes. And, and he's, he's biting on the, it looks like he's either biting his finger or the end of the flower there. If anyone knows for sure, comment and let me know. I looked a couple of times, but, and he looks so shy and so vulnerable and so, um, nervous i would say scared that that she was is going to reject him but so excited that they're finally seeing each other eye to eye and see and so excited that she can see <laughs> in general and you know she touches his hand she rubs his hand and uh the end on that 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 famous close up of, of his face and what a reaction i mean everything it's just again there's so much in that in that happens there with no dialogue unbelievable what you can do with cinema without saying anything now i'm not putting dialogue down i love dialogue 
driven uh, films and, and stories and you could do all kinds of things with movies and, and cinema in general. But just looking at this film, you really, you, it really makes me realize how powerful this medium is when you're in the hands of a man like Charlie Chaplin, what you can do without saying anything. And, and he really f believed that the talkies were just going to come and go. And, you know, this is 1931. We are, this was four years into the talkies. No one was interested in making silent films. And he stood his ground and he, he was going to make a silent film. And that was that. And he realized <laughs> during production that these, um, these talkies weren't going anywhere. And so he incorporated, of course, sound and sound effects uh, into, the, into the film as as well as the music, I mean, my God, the 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 score of this film is unbelievable. It's so on the nose uh, for all of the the feelings within it. And where I normally don't like scores to be so on the nose of the the feelings that are in the story, uh, I prefer a, a more complimentary uh, score where it's not telling you exactly how to feel e each step of the way. But when it's done this well. And, and, you know, there's many examples of films where it is done so, so well. I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm right there. You, you, you tell me where to go, Chaplin. <laughs> you tell me how to feel. You, you, you tell me exactly what you want. Um, I, I don't want it any other way. And, and so it's, um, it's a, it's just, it's absolutely remarkable. But just touching back on this element of seeing is, again, I think, uh, I don't know, you know, I wonder if on a subconscious level, and for anyone who's a big Chaplin expert or knows a lot about Chaplin, let me know. Because as I said, yes, it was obvious in the beginning of the film how, you know, he has the characters speak and it's just gibberish coming out of their mouth before they unveil the statue. But a big part of this film was that no one can see him until she can see him. Uh, you know, the millionaire doesn't really know him uh, and only recognizes him when he's drunk, when he's sober, he's like, get this guy out of here. I don't, I don't recognize him. And, and no one can really see him. I mean, he's this, he's a hero and everyone is, doesn't know that about him, what he's done for this woman. They see him as the quote unquote tramp. And that is really universal in a lot of ways. Cause if you think about it, we always see types, you know, you see, uh, someone behaving in a certain way. You may put them, label them and put them in a certain box, but we are so much more complicated uh, than than one feeling or one type of of person, and so everybody does that. We all label people and and make assumptions about people, and we don't really see one another. And I think that was also knocking the talkies because now we're being encouraged in films to only uh, to yes see, of course. But to listen to to the dialogue, and he said, and he again is saying, "No, look, see, um, look at me, look at my uh, and everybody in this film. Look at our reactions, look at our behavior, and and that will bring out the emotions, that will bring out the story, that will bring out the psychology of the characters. You don't need to hear us say anything. You just need to." Look at us, see the way we behave, see what we want, see what is psychologically driving everyone in the story. And that will, will tell the story. That will be more powerful than ever. And maybe that isn't always the case, but when Chaplin did it, it was certainly the case. There also is, there also is this great scene where um, one of the, the parties where uh, the, the, the millionaires, where, where he's with the millionaire, is is that everyone wants to hear a, a piano and and he he has swallowed a whistle and so he's hiccuping and so the sound of the whistle is coming out through the hiccups and so again everyone wants to again listen to the piano you know like with talkies listen to the dialogue and he again is interrupting <laughs> the the tramp uh or as chaplin as the tramp is interrupting and stopping and annoying everyone uh, from listening and again encouraging you to look, which was another you know clear criticism and knock to the uh, talkies of the day. Uh, so I absolutely love it. If you have not seen it, it is on the Criterion Channel, as well as some wonderful features on the the making of this film. There's eight minutes of footage of him shooting the scene with um, 
uh, Virginia Cheryl as the blind girl. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching and or listening. If you are currently listening to this on the audio version of my YouTube channel and you've run out of episodes to listen to, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I have ever recorded can be found. Go to youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in supporting me over on Patreon and getting bonus content at the same time, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. And if this is your first time here on my YouTube channel, please consider subscribing by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes or when I go live. It is absolutely free to subscribe. Thank you again so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.